Okay, we're going to be really on time today. Um, we rarely are, so it's wonderful to see, to have this wonderful panelist here with us uh, to talk about a subject um, that's kind of, this is part of the uh, Breathing Space um, series. And welcome to the Miller Theater. I'm the Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and I'm uh, delighted to see so many of you, and I'm sure there are a lot of students in the audience. Um, and tonight's program is a free lecture as I mentioned, it's part of our breathing space, Contemporary Art from Hong Kong. And I just want to let you know that the show has been extended. Uh, it will now be uh, extended to um, August 13th. So please tell your friends about it. Um, the show will continue uh, to the summer, and it's, it's still free. So please come back and see the exhibition. And for me, I'm really delighted. Uh, this is a topic that I have been uh, very interested in, the creative economy uh, here uh, in Hong Kong. And I was watching um, uh, a Bloomberg interview just yesterday, uh, and they were interviewing uh, uh, Kai Fu Lee, who formerly was Google, uh, was at Google and Google China. And Kai Fu um, was telling, uh, being interviewed about AI. And one of the things he said that was, I found it very interesting is that um, he spoke at the, I think, Columbia University's commencement address. So I think you can uh, find it on YouTube. Uh, but one of the things he predicted is that AI will be replacing, uh, with AI, a lot of the jobs like in, in the banking sector, in many sectors, uh, will be kind of obsolete in the, in the coming future. And one industry that he said that will not see AI displacing um, uh, uh, workers or, uh, is really the creative economy and the arts. So for those of you who are studying uh, the arts and are interested in the creative economy, it's nice to know that you are not going to be replaced by robots. And I think it just says uh, the importance of creativity and continuing uh, to create. So I'm really delighted that we have a wonderful panel uh, panel uh, to talk about this topic. Uh, Morgan Wong, who I just met, an artist here based in Hong Kong, and he has exhibited uh, widely in, uh, in North America and in Europe, as well in Asia. Uh, and he is um, a video and installation artist and lives here and work in Hong Kong. And we also have uh, Alan Lowe, a collector. Alan is somebody who is uh, very much uh, part of the um, collecting scene as well as the art scene, uh, being a board member of Parasite as well as uh, Tate Modern um, Asia's Pacific Acquisition Committee and also part of the member of our Basel's Global Patrons Council and a good friend of Asia Society, so Alan is with us, as well as um, Tina Pang, I, Professor Tina Pang. I, uh, I know Tina uh, from uh, before when she was teaching at uh, Hong Kong University, and she is now the visual, uh, the uh, visual culture uh, curator of Hong Kong visual culture at M Plus. So Tina, uh, thank you for being here. And tonight we're being um, the moderator for tonight's program is Professor Frank Vigorong. Uh, Frank is an old friend of Asia Society here in Hong Kong and curated. Uh, help us curate one of our most successful exhibition with the Caravaggio um, a few years back. So we're delighted, and I'm going to turn it over to Frank to get the program started. Thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, I, you know, we always end up looking very rude, looking at our, our telephone, but that's where my questions are. So don't be offended by that. Um, the first uh, thought I had when I looked at creative economy. Uh, was the term economy, of course. Uh, I personally prefer the term ecology when we talk about it. It's less contentious, I would say, although I don't think this is contentious at all. And it reminded me also of uh, this idea of uh, creative industries. And uh, this is a topic that a lot of people had talked about for, for quite a while. And I was always st struck a number of years ago uh, people like Long Po, for instance, and Jia Jin Fai, who are very gong ho about creative industries and talking to people at the Hong Kong government, and it very often felt like what we say in French, a uh, dialogue between deaf people. It really looked like the government people were only focusing on the idea of industry, whereas the artists were focusing on the idea of creativity. And there seemed to be very little common ground between the, the, the two groups of people. So when we talk about uh, creativity and economy, I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding. And oh, to be perfectly honest, I myself, I'm never quite sure where, where, what we're talking about. 
And when you look at the history of the term creative industry, this is something that, like a lot of things, in fact, um, was first uh, established in the UK. It's very much a sort of Thatcherite uh, vision of the arts and as something that should be self-sustaining, basically, and where you know where it should basically generate its own funding and, and work as something that can even uh, generate uh, a profit. And this creates a number of circumstances that makes life extremely difficult for institutions and also for artists. So when we talk about uh, creative economy or creative industries, and this is really the first question that I'm addressing to my uh, uh, three panelists here. Um, when we talk about art in particular, uh, what are we talking about when we mention the term creative industries? Because even in my little tiny, tiny uh, fine arts department, when people talk about art, they usually, very often, they don't talk about the same things at all. A professor teaching uh, calligraphy teaches art, but a professor who is more interested in socially engaged art practices also teaches art. And there is no common ground between the two. So how do we bring all these trends together. How does the idea of a creative economy uh, function in a field, the field of art, that occupies such a wide range of practices that it seems impossible to encompass all of them? So I'm... Um, Tina, you, you are at M+, plus. you are sort of specializing on Hong Kong art, and I was wondering what it is for you to you know, be a curator of Hong Kong art. How wide is your range of, of interest? <clears throat> I think maybe I'll, I'll just add a little bit to your introduction in that I think also the kind of creative economy and creative industries, they're obviously kind of a trade and industry thing. It's some, something that's a convenient package in a sense for us to promote overseas and, and, and to attract investment or, or whatever. But it's also one of the things that I think is very much um, cited in kind of quality of life index, you know, as something that um, the, a, a very strong uh, cultural ecology, to use your preferred word, which I also prefer, um, uh, and uh, a, a, a cultural landscape is something that I think figures very highly in terms of um, how we determine a kind of quality of life or access to a quality of life. Um, I think from an institutional perspective, um, I don't like to say institutional perspective, but I, I would like to share maybe just an anecdote of um, uh, from a, a colleague of mine, Eve Tam, who's director of the Art Museum. And I, uh, you know, in, in 2003, which of course was a very, very dark year in Hong Kong, uh, during, at the height of SARS, um, of course we lost Leslie Jiang, and so all sorts of things happened that year, it was a very dark time. And she was uh, at the time working at the Heritage Museum, and she was in the midst of curating an exhibition with a number of Hong Kong artists, and many of them wanted to withdraw and they felt that it's not appropriate at this time to sort of take part in an exhibition. And um, she, you know, I, I feel a little bit embarrassed to actually be sort of trying to paraphrase her because she said it in such an eloquent way when she shared this anecdote um, uh, with us, which was, I think, um, during a panel at AAA. And uh, she talked about how important it was and how even more important it was to have a project like that at the Heritage Museum that engaged um, the artists that helped, you know, she, talk, she talked about it in a way that I guess it's a little bit old fashioned now, but to talk about that kind of uplifting uh, capacity of art to take you away from the kind of darkness or the troubles or, you know, take you away from everyday life and to take you into another sphere in which you can think about other things, you know, phil philosophy, aesthetics, beauty, um, the higher things. So, I mean, it's a very simplistic way of talking about it, but I think that that's, in a sense, kind of a function or, of an institution. Um, 
I think for M plus, of course, we're an institution that exists, but it doesn't have a physical building yet. Um, the we are a public institution, and I think that that's that's um, certainly I think a very strong kind of moral and ethical um, Im imperative behind. Uh, what we do when, uh, well, M plus is not just an art museum, it's a, a visual culture museum. And so there is very much a sense that um, we're, we're, we are holding things in trust or that we are um, creating a, um, a collection or a situation uh, within which certain kinds of conversations or certain kinds of discussions through visual culture can take place. So it's very abstract, but it's just sure. a, that'll we, we'll be brief because we, I we'll go back to, to more specific questions about collecting and so on. Okay. But uh, Alan, when when you are you're here as a collector, by the way, <laughs> just to remind you. <laughs> um, you're interested very much in uh, local art productions. How how wide is your range of interest? Because you know a lot of things could fit the bill of being Hong Kong art, ranging from calligraphy to again socially engaged art practices. How do you see yourself in that in that context? You know, well, well, what what are your tastes? Uh, how do you choose? Uh, and how do you think it can maybe help this ec ec ecology? Um, I suppose. Um well, taste-wise, it's 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 a bit arbitrary. It's a bit random. I'm, I can't can't say I'm the most disciplined of of uh, of collectors, if I even call myself a collector. Well, let's just say I am a collector today. <laughs> um, I guess um, yes, born and raised in Hong Kong. You know, having that's that that kind of special connection with the city it obviously it it does it, in a way it does appeal to you in a in a in, a, in kind of a it's hard to it's hard to describe in 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 to have the right word for it but um i think there's also there's also a certain um kind of a certain kind of unique character or quality with uh, with um sort of with hong kong art or sort of artistic practices in Hong Kong that kind of um is makes it very interesting with you know l taking the the political landscape into consideration taking um taking kind of um you know kind of the the the, the urban situation into into consideration the fact that we're a very very small place um in the context of you know China and Asia it's it's uh a very crazy situation and and i think it's also it makes um the artistic practice extremely challenging mm -hmm. but i think it's it's exactly what makes um uh, why we have we are producing uh, uh why the city is producing um great artists and 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 great practices and and i think um uh it's been very overlooked um, for the longest time, but finally, I think in the last sort of three, four years, um, the um, the community, well, the, the the Hong Kong community as well as the regional community internationally, I think people are starting to. There's so much happening with you know with with uh, with art trade mm -hmm. to a point people kind of start to wonder. Or question also, what about the artists? So it's 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 it was a little bit of a, a weird situation where a city kind of developed, or or kind of or, where the scene kind of uh, um, took off. First, you have an art fair, and then and then everything kind of else kind of came into place. So it's it was very much kind of a top down kind of thing. Strange, but I mean it's the reality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was also. I wanted to know about again this incredibly wide range of practices that all fall under the name of art, which sometimes makes 
you know, debating about art itself extremely confusing because people on the same stage might talk about completely different things that are nothing in that have nothing in common. But I was thinking about since we're talking about art fairs, uh, Ink Asia, you know, uh, this that I can't help seeing as related to a debate that was more alive probably 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh, about Chineseness. Yeah. You know, so thank God it's kind of disappearing a little bit. Mm. <laughs> and now that um, uh, Art Hong Kong first and then Art Basel has really created a, and that's where the term ecology, I think, is even more valid than the mm. term economy. Uh, the environment is completely different. And it's been very visibly different over the last five, six years. But what are, and also, you know, I'm thinking at M plus, you are dealing with Hong Kong art and, and Leslie is dealing with ink art, but you know, there's a great deal of overlap. So how do you guys deal with these <laughs> questions? You, do you collect uh, things that, you know, you would buy, for instance, at Ink Asia or? I've never been at Ink Asia. Okay. <laughs> so but I I've think heard think of it. You were. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to go this year. <laughs> sure. Is it still around? Yeah. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Your time is coming lately. <laughs> let, 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 let's let's hear oh, what. Uh, yeah. Well, I. Oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. He's oh. he's he's raising a a, a, sp a specific question. I th if if I'm not if I'm not mistaking, which is oh. about. I don't think there's anything wrong yeah. with Engagia, but the, it, it raises a lot of interesting question. I think. So yeah. That, you know? uh, so I think I th I think the question is about um, uh, it's a little bit about marketing. And it's a little bit about um, cultural framing, um, but I think. Um, in a sense, I mean, it also goes back to maybe questions about um, whether there should be an independent ink museum. There was a lot of debate at one point about this. Um, I think they're all parts of the same kind of conversation, uh, and there are many different sides to it. It's a very complex, it's a very complex picture that you know thousands of years of tradition in a sense, but it's being framed in a particular way at this moment. So it's a very com contemporary kind of framing. Um, and it does have to do with, um, um, I guess, a market decision, uh, exploiting a new market or creating a new market out of something which is already there. Um, and in a sense, it's what Alan was saying about a kind of underrepresented, under, under, um, under the radar kind of uh, situation. Um, I, I think attention is good. Of course, it's a, it increases education. It increases, a, 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 channels a lot of resources into, um, I mean, when we, when we talk about the, the commerce that is around Art Basel or around uh, different kinds of affairs, of course, now the, the, um, the drive is to create a situation where there is a lot more education. And mm -hmm. so you will see around these, uh, the fairs and the auctions, there are a lot of academic lectures, a lot of um, uh, scholars who who are invited to come, uh, especially uh, around this, um, the, 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 you know, the commercial activities. So it's sort of, I mean, you alluded to it too, a kind of trickle-down effect. It's a, there is a, a, a broadening of knowledge across the field. Um, uh, about my, my own work with Leslie, of course, it's um, at, at M Plus, we have, and it's a little bit about our, our work in general uh, in Hong Kong, um, is that um, we work in a complementary way to how the other museums are operating. Of course, the Museum of Art has a 50-year head start on us in terms of their collections, in terms of their uh, engagement with Hong Kong art and um, um, the, the depth of their collections and their approach and their own institutional history, um, and the Heritage Museum as well. Um, and so how does M Plus being built at this particular historical moment um, complement what those other institutions are doing? Um, and I think really what, what M Plus is doing in terms of ink is, um, for me, incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. It's really framing um, or reframing the conversation about ink, which is outside of, in a sense, what what you mentioned, which is this 
very strict cultural framing and taking it outside of that or looking at the, um, or speculating even sometimes at how um, it's, it's links with dance, music, mm -hmm. chance yes. operations, uh, <coughs> artists like John Cage, Mus Cunningham, the abstract expressionists, and, and expanding the language, not just in a formal sense, because I think that that's very simple, quite, quite easy to do, but expanding that kind of intellectual tradition and intellectual history. And there was a very strong conversation between many of the contemporary Incartas and developments uh, outside of mm -hmm. the Chinese cultural sphere. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, um, there are opportunities there where, you know, beyond kind of the, the shorthand of marketing and uh, so on, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting part of the collection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go back to your question about Ink Asia and if there was something wrong about <laughs> this art fair. Of course not, clearly. Uh, but the, the whole issue of, of ink, as you said, is both uh, about marketing and about, it's about art history. It's about also very potent political positions. And uh, I was uh, struck by how ink is now a term that covers again also a very wide range of our practices and it was uh, very visible for instance uh, the um, shanghai art f art world expo was in 2010 right right yes and the hong kong government organized two exhibition of hong kong artists one for contemporary art and the other one for ink art and it was titled ink art versus ink art but you had video, you had, of course, painting, you had installations also in the exhibition about ink art. So now ink has taken a much wider uh, conceptual uh, frame, in fact. And you were talking also about the visibility of Hong Kong artists. Um, you were talking about Gérard, a uh, colleague of mine at uh, Alliance Française, you know, Fat Guok Man who's been here for a long time. And uh, we were talking about this uh, 15 years ago when you were talking, when, oh, Kurt, my colleague, Kurt Chan, you know, he was an artist at the Venice Biennale in 2004, and he was talking to, to Chinese artists about Hong Kong artists. And the reaction was usually, you have artists in Hong Kong? And yes, it was, you know, it was either they were not there, or if people heard about Hong Kong artists, they were not Chinese enough which is another statement that is so abysmally strange that it's, you know, it's hard to understand. And this is one of the good things that happened with you know, the, what you define as a top-down opening of the frame. And uh, Morgan, you are very, very young, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the, I'll take the custom. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering um, how was it is it useful now to be a hong kong artist when you exhibit all over the world is it an identity you 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 enjoy having that's interesting um i think actually um uh your question is like how useful you are trying to frame yourself um in different kind of framework and um i think artists have been great um by navigating into different kind of social class and also different um, um, different groups in, in the society. And that's why um, it's actually naturally that um, we have different identity. Like, like even myself, um, I just started to write. So I'm now like being a writer as well. Yeah, and then like how you are navigating yourself into these different networks, then you can actually help yourself in your career or like what you want to achieve i think that's a that's a good thing um that actually um i think it's actually the whole scene that actually give you uh a kind of um legitimacy to call yourself as a hong kong artist and then that can actually benefit to um, your own career um whereas maybe earlier then you have to put on another name tag for yourself um, of being a Chinese artist or like of being 
well, or maybe just being an artist, yeah. Um, I mean, that's actually what I'm always trying to tell myself of not being framed by anything, but then just um, being an artist. Even though sometimes it's easier for like um, different people, like curator, like writer, or like um, cultural historian, for them to kind of frame um, artists or artworks into um, different framework to tell their own stories. Yeah, so... Um, uh, be, me mentioning how young you were, I was also, sorry, I should have mentioned this, but I had in mind uh, Zhao Zhenfai and Lam Dongpang, who in the early, you know, 2005 or six, uh, felt they had to go to Beijing to establish their studio because otherwise they would have no visibility at all in Hong Kong. But this has changed very, very profoundly, I think. Yeah, yeah, very, very profoundly, I think, um, because of, I think it's really because of the fair, but also I have to say that um, even I mean, Venice, I think Venice uh, made a huge difference yeah. when when well first with Lee Kit and then with Chang Kin Wah. Chang Kin Wah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, speaking, I think locally, like um, with the fair, I think it really is a driving force that um, drive up not only just the commercial scene, but also bring up like awareness of having non-profit in um, in Hong Kong. Going back to your question, actually, um, you were speaking about um, Chao Chun Fai and Lam Dong Pang actually went to Beijing in 2000... 2006 or seven, something like that. Interestingly, yeah. I actually haven't uh -huh. speak with them. Uh, maybe I have, but I can't remember. I also actually have been in Beijing, but I was in Beijing in 2009. Uh -huh. And then, uh, I mean, I haven't talked with them about uh, what's difference actually there is with our own experience. And um, I'm actually coming from a little bit different background because they are actually um, from the Chinese U, which is a more kind of um, the well. Be, be if, careful what you're going to say. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would say like yeah. So they are from the Chinese U and stop. And then um, yeah, you. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, what, what did you want to say? And then um, you were going to say more traditional, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> you get me wrong. <laughs> but I'm going to stop here. And then um, so I am actually coming from um, creative media, actually um, from City University. Uh -huh. And um, at that context, I mean, in 2007, I actually graduated from my BA. Um, from that context, actually, um, I aspire to be an artist, but uh, I find myself, um, I'm finding my way to navigate into the, into the, to the art scene in Hong Kong. And, um, and so actually, um, in the end, I find myself actually in Beijing. Um, f uh, getting a job in, in, in a gallery in Beijing and then trying to work my way out being an artist. Mm -hmm. And that's why actually working in Beijing is weirdly actually my kind of first hand or first experience of encountering mm -hmm. contemporary art instead of being in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And after that, like I, I continue with my, with my journey of, mm -hmm. of contemporary right. art. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And was this being from Hong Kong, what would, did it create more opportunity, less opportunity, or was it completely indifferent when you were in Beijing? You mean, you mean, what do you mean exactly? You, when you were in Beijing, you were yeah. also trying to show your work to exhibit. Yeah, I was, right. I was. Yeah, actually, so, in Beijing, mm -hmm. I was um, working in a gallery, and at the same time, I create my own works. I had exhibition in Beijing, as well as actually um, invited by Parasite. Actually, that really changed my whole career. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. in it was as one of the most um, um, significant event in my early career mm -hmm. that um, me, um, Leung Chi Wo, uh, uh, Lam Tong Pang, um, Lee Kit, and also Cedric, um, we all five were invited by um, Parasite Curator to uh, Afro and then to go to um, Tate Modern for the 10th anniversary oh, yes. show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah. yeah, that actually, it's one of the most important event. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, also, I have to say that uh, my uh, my boss in Beijing, uh, Lang Ling, uh, who is the gallery director for um, Beijing Commune and also um, director for Pace Beijing, he's super supportive to um, young artists like me. And he knows that I'm actually searching myself um, of being an artist. So actually, he also granted me for um, uh, two months to go for residency 
during my work in in Beijing. Mm -hmm. So I was really grateful for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I have to really speak out. All right. Okay. <laughs> yes. But uh, okay, so, so, sorry to insist, but sorry that maybe the, I no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. The fact that you were from Hong Kong was not relevant in, for your uh, for your time in Beijing. Nobody cared. Uh, I think in Beijing mm -hmm. it's actually quite an interesting scene. Like uh, the acceptance is is uh, very huge. That um, they see you as I mean you are a Hong Kong artist for sure because you don't really speak Mandarin and I mean your your Mandarin is poor and also um, <laughs> and um, and also um, well because I, I think it's it's natural that you have a slightly different background but I think it's just the same as you are from Hong Kong then you're from Tibet or you're from Xinjiang or yeah. from other province mm -hmm. and um, and then also especially like um, from from overseas as well yeah there are there have there, there were already quite a number of uh, overseas artists based mm. in Beijing at that time already mm -hmm. yeah for sure um, no need to mention now yeah mm -hmm. All right. um, let's go back to the influence the impact of large institutions on this uh, creative economy um, I have a very specific uh, little story there was at um, Pearl Lam, I think, an exhibition of uh, uh, Hong Kong artists from the 1990s. It was a couple of years ago. And M Plus acquired a number of, of pieces from that exhibition. And, and some of my colleagues were saying, but you know, it could have cost a lot less if they had approached the artist. And I was wondering, you know, what, what role is an institution like M Plus playing in the larger uh, context of the, the ecology of art? Because I think what the people from M Plus answering that question were saying is that it's better to support uh, the galleries than directly the artists, because that's creating a better eco ecology than if you only buy directly from the artist. Is that true? Because it was all rumors, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think everything is a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. Those, uh, those acquisitions, I think, took place bef before I joined M Plus. Um, but I think it's uh, we we well. I mean, we're talking about the ecology as a whole, and I think um, for uh, for artists and for collectors and for um, the public, the general public, I think it's in everyone's best interest to have successful, uh, ambitious, functioning galleries. And I think it's important also that we. Um, all of us respect their work. There's a lot of work that goes on uh, behind, um, I mean, galleries like Han Art and Alison Fine Arts. Those have been going for a really long time. Of course, Grotto, that has been, is the, is the only gallery in Hong Kong that really supports only exclusively Hong Kong artists. Um, and I think it's um, I important to support their work. I mean, if if everyone went directly to the artists, then there would be no platform anymore for good curated shows. I mean, the, you you talked about Parasite, of course, they're a non-profit space, but um, the um, the intellectual landscape that uh, good galleries can can contribute to in a mature society is, I think, important for everyone. Um, in the case of that show, the Paul Lam show, it was uh -huh. curated by David Chan, uh, who's a very respected, um, a, a very, um, um, a very interesting and uh, important curator, I think, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and the, those works were historical show, uh, historical works that had been recreated or um, were being uh, framed within the context of a particular historical moment in Hong Kong art history. Um, and I think it was important to support that work. Uh, and uh, it's it's also, I think, a lot of galleries. Um, in Hong Kong were established, maybe not with the long-term um, role of a gallery in their relationship with an artist in mind necessarily. So I think it remains in Hong Kong that you don't have exclusive 
relationships with galleries. A lot of artists will, will work with multiple galleries, perhaps for different series of works. Um, and uh, I guess in the long term, uh, we would like to see, you know, galleries have a kind of more um, supportive role for artists in the long run. And I think that one of the dangers, of course, for all of this interest in Hong Kong artists uh, at, at a particular moment is that, uh, especially for younger artists, that there can be a kind of impatience, perhaps, on everyone's part to 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 try to um, um, I don't want to use the word capitalize, but there's a, there's a, there is a little bit of anxiety that it could be over in a moment, yes. or or a particular artist moment might be over, um, and that's that's perhaps a wider wider question for the whole of the the art world, including we haven't talked about it yet, but of course the circuit of biennials, triennials, exhibitions that happen um, mm. uh, worldwide, uh, where there is a kind of um, um, a kind of insatiability about discovering new talent or or exposing uh, younger artists and uh, from around the world, um, international artists. Um, but uh, yes, I think that going going, I'm, I'm sort of losing my train of thought <laughs> now. But um, I yeah, in the, for the long term health, I think of individual artists and for galleries, it is uh, important for um for galleries to to be able to sustain themselves and to not just represent artists uh latest works but also become a place where um uh good collectors are able to um are able to work with galleries for finding a good home for for works that they no longer wish to keep um and from the other end, I know for for curators and other institutions that are hoping to show certain kinds of artists within their shows, often a gallery will be the place that they go to. Uh, and they will say, you know, I would like this work by Lee Kit, and can you act as a liaison to contact the collector and work on our behalf to borrow that? So it's sort of um, for a mature, you know, uh, not just local but international ecology uh, galleries play an important role so yeah. it's a it's a it's very tough i mean hong kong is the real estate situation um you know it's a spaces are small I, I still don't understand why all the galleries need to be in the middle of central. <laughs> I think that Hong Kong is probably the only place where we have galleries in in the in the banking district um but uh, I think, um, I mean, we talk about economy and I think market, we can, I know we, we, we always try to avoid the whole market conversation, but, but, but after all, I think um, in terms of the whole ecosystem, I think the market does play a role. I mean, it's, you have institutions, you have, you have, um, you know, collectors, the patrons, and and I, I think you know, and whether we like it or not, there's the auction as well. So I think there's, um, Hong Kong itself has, um, has done, you know, really well in in certain fronts. But I think there's there's still so much that we can, so much more that we can do. You know, um, we we have a we have great um, spaces, uh, commercial gallery spaces. Um, um uh, at the moment i think uh you know you have the blue chip galleries you have kind of the international dealers coming into hong kong but then um if you really think about um kind of your homegrown gallerist dealer who 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 um has a com who commits to hong kong artists as well as kind of having a, that regional international program there's really very few i can think of one maybe but um but i think it first seen to be complete i guess in a way to fully mature i think there's still there's still um work to be done yeah you were talking about the fear of all this sort of <laughs> vanishing 
and these chances for young artists to not be there in the, the near future. I think it's a real fear. I, I, I hear it from my students in particular. Uh, do you have thoughts on this? How, how hopeful are you to see the, the, the art ecology of Hong Kong to be sustainable for the foreseeable future? Well, I think as long as artists continue to create good work, <laughs> it's know, really. I mean, I, I, they, no, they've, I'm, they've been creating good work for a yeah. very long time, yeah. and nobody noticed until, uh, you know, Magnus Renfrew came along <laughs> and started the first. Well, the situation is yes. a lot more favorable yeah. now. I think mm -hmm. you know, uh, and but it's. Um, I do. I do think it's important important for artists not to get swept away sometimes mm -hmm. by 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 certain kind of uh, situations and to concentrate a lot on on their own practice to, mm -hmm. to be able to guard that time you know to mm -hmm. guard that kind of creativity um, and to take risks I think it's important for artists to take risks so do mm -hmm. I don't think it you know of course there are there are economic realities but I think it's also important for you to push yourself because there's sort of uh, in the lifetime of an artist you think well post graduation five years is very short ten years is pretty short but you know you have a whole life ahead of you of of um art making mm -hmm. and um it's um i think important to have that kind of longer term perspective mm -hmm. um that uh yeah and to to, to take risks i think it it not to be afraid of failing from, you know, for, for you know, I know. It's I know, sort of a, for, for, are, for, for making know. kind of missteps, because I think you learn from those too. Yes. It's also very important to I'm have. I'm sure, but this is so hard to say to young people. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't, be <laughs> don't be afraid to fail is something coming from me sounds a bit yeah. hypocritical. No, but it's, <laughs> very, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I worked for a long time in an institution that didn't uh -huh. collect, and yes. only just recently in the past few years in, in an institution that collects, and um, and it's very interesting that you do, from um, an institutional perspective, you very quickly kind of hone in on these breakthrough works or periods where there's a, a very specific moment when thinking changes or practice changes. Mm -hmm. And it tells you a lot about an artist in the whole kind of span mm -hmm. of um their creative practice and it can be those moments that that can can end up being very something very special mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to add on that i think actually one of the important thing is to to hong kong artists like how we are actually um communicating really with um the whole art world like to communicate not as in just kind of to seeing shows but then to really have dialogue uh intellectually not only just like verbal mm -hmm. but also like within works like how we can actually have dialogues with the other art scene like in new york in london or in in berlin um how actually we can create kind of like a whole um synchronization in a way to not only just to adapt what people are doing, but then to also export what we are doing mm -hmm. to other people. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I often thought that it's starting to be a little bit easier for Hong Kong artists to go out. You know, we have the, the uh, Asia Art Council, you know, the, those fellowships and so on. But I think a lot of effort should be made to bring people in a lot more people in, but then we get back to the problem of the real estate. You know, it's super expensive to get people in in Hong Kong. And, you know, I was thinking of um, uh, V54. You know about V54? It's uh, uh, Paul Angkok who manages that. It's a beautiful house in Happy Valley, but the rooms are really tiny. They have a common room, but the artists are not allowed to uh, leave their stuff there after 8 o'clock. So it's the, the management is, is absolutely disastrous, okay? And it's I think we, we need more people from outside coming in because it's easier for Hong Kong artists to go out now. But this is, you know, long time. Uh, you said the word, uh, biennial. <laughs> so uh, is, I, I guess it's too early to say, but are there plans for a Hong Kong biennial? There already is one, isn't there? 
at the run by the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Oh, yes, but no, it okay, became come on. an award. <laughs> 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 sure, no, 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 no. I mean an international exhibition, something. Well, I emulating think. not Venice, of course, this is too big. But something that would bring people from outside, precisely. Well, to, to Hong be Kong. honest, yes. I mean, I feel mm. that uh, I mean there are plenty of biennials and triennials, and sure. you know, m mm -hmm. many of them in this part of the world too, yeah. in Korea, in Japan. Um, there is Venice. Um, I I don't know that we need another one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a tremendous pressure. I think these are very sort of pressure cooker type type situations yes. and I I um I think there's there are, there are plenty I think probably what we need are more exhibitions maybe we need <laughs> yes. to look at a new model cuz yeah. it seems yeah. like it's mm. like a it's like a check you know every city yeah. every yeah, city government yeah. is like oh yes. let's do a biennial mm -hmm. it's yeah. uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's become I mean, there's so many yeah. and I'm sure you know I mean I can't speak for my colleagues in the in the Hong Kong Museum of Art but I'm sure they they've been trying to sort of figure out a way of how how to make that a lot more effective, and I know they've been you know taking part in different kinds of biennials outside of Hong Kong too. Um, but um, what you mentioned about the Asia Expo, actually the Ink versus Ink, um, is very much a kind of hangover or a bit of baggage from the way that um, the Hong Kong Art Biennial has been structured. It's mm -hmm. been very that's much right. kind of ink versus Western media. Yes. Um, and that's a very uh, traditional yes. kind of baggage. Yes. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think absolutely like you, it's, a, it's probably a new model. We're, we're mm -hmm. a little bit beyond that now. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. tremendously uh, resource heavy and I think uh, um, it seems to be more of a platform for kind of catapulting. Yeah, yeah, check, you know, if you you curator of this biennial or mm -hmm, you curator mm -hmm. of that biennial. Um, I, I think um, if, if you're asking me if M Plus has any plans, no, not as far as I know. Mm -hmm. No, we have plenty of work on our plate sure. right now. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned also earlier at the beginning of this discussion the quality of life index. I'm sorry, it's the first time I hear that in Hong Kong. Oh, I, you know, I know hear. very little about it, okay, but I know yes. that, you know, with, with often, um, you know how there are often these headlines about how Hong Kong is is falling down the list of cities that is desirable <laughs> for uh, attracting expat executives mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, certainly, you know, there are many, many things that are in this kind of index, like clean air and uh, mm -hmm. affordability affordable housing and yes. um mm -hmm. but but i uh cultural uh cultural life a mm -hmm. rich cultural life mm -hmm. is certainly among them mm -hmm. yeah, because i i was wanted to compare it to the situation of singapore where everything is government <laughs> led and this quality of life index is one of their obsession and their idea of creating uh, a more uh, friendly environment for the arts, and they don't talk about in ecology, is to create these big museums and so on. And it's openly uh, for the purpose of bringing in international businessmen and you know, people working for companies and so on. So I was, it, that's something you never hear in Hong Kong, which I find wonderful, actually. We, we don't need that sort of thing, I think, that sort of debate anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'll. I will go back to the fact that, you know, M plus and the whole West Canning Cultural District is completely publicly funded, mm -hmm. um, government funded. Mm -hmm. And it's um uh, but you that's a big project, but I think there's a lot of government funding that is um you know, channeled towards supporting spaces like Oil Street, which is a, a really um great incubator um for um emerging curators as mm -hmm. well as uh, for artists to get the opportunity to show in a non-profit space that mm -hmm. it's not as uh, heavily curated, let's say, mm -hmm. as somewhere like Parasite. Mm -hmm. um, and Parasite itself is also uh, doing a lot of programs that are about uh, nurturing um, internationally a kind of emerging um, curators mm -hmm. and um, giving opportunities for younger artists. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about catering to um, an international standard of, um, you know, livability. Yes. It is. It is also about trying to genuinely, I think, I increase the quality of life for everyone living here. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and institutions 
play a role in that, I believe, play a role in that for people who uh, many of us are very fortunate to travel, but for for the wider population that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to travel. Right now in Sha Tin, you can see the Louvre. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there there uh, is a place in which we uh, can place ourselves in which it, it, within a wider world uh, um, and uh, longer histories and different histories. And uh, so uh, I think institutions play an important role mm -hmm. in doing that. Mm -hmm. How about private collectors? How how easy is it to show your collections to? How does that work? Very difficult. Yeah. I mean, you have. Um, I guess well, fortunately, unfortunately, I mean, you, you, this is we're not we're not living in a city like Berlin where you can pay very little or relatively uh, 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 small sums of money to to acquire or rent a space um and to, to to and to do programming it's 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 very difficult um but then so you so you kind of need to look at um kind of alternative ways to um you know what like what we what we do at Duddles where where we kind of try to create mm -hmm. um sort of you know how do you how do you deal with the idea of an art space combined with kind of an eat and drink and social situation but still but but still kind of um be able to work with serious curators and institutions and collectors and uh, other nonprofits um or you, or you have a kind of other solutions, other kind of artists, um, um, curator-driven spaces, like things that can happen in some sort of where um, it's it's kind of the kind of the other s side of the spectrum. Um, but uh, well, it's the cre it's the creative economy, right? We're mm -hmm. all creative, <laughs> and we all try to find solutions. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's uh, you know the, oh, yes, there are certain kind of Maybe perhaps more more established or box standard ideas, the the white cube type of space, mm -hmm. or the private museum where you you see a lot of that in China. One every you know collectors you know star architects big buildings, mm -hmm. um, very impressive. So I think Hong Kong needs to look at a, a, maybe a, a different situation. Hong Kong is a different situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. I've always wondered what was the motivation for a private collector to go out of their way to take on themselves, you know, so much work to show, you know, exhibitions. Because, you know, for uh, an artist, it's your job basically to do that. <laughs> but for a private collector, I think it's the kind of mission that is, especially in a place like Hong Kong, particularly difficult. So I, I do have to <laughs> congratulate you on this. <laughs> Um, did you have any commissions from local institutions, and I mean publicly funded? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so um, I did commission for uh, by Oil Street actually um, for one of the exhibition, and um, like Parasite, and um, okay, let me think about what other. Yeah, I think yeah, that's. If mm -hmm. you're meaning like local institution, yeah, sure, nonprofit, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope I don't miss any. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sort of running out of questions now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I. Oh, see, of course. Come on, of course. <laughs> you. <laughs> it's interesting because obviously, like I, I couldn't even remember the title of the talk before I came in. <laughs> um, but then you know we we spoke a lot about sort of art in the context of creative economy, but actually, um, I guess, strictly speaking, in a, on a sort of bureaucratic government level, um, the creative economy belongs to, I think, the, the Commerce Bureau, and I believe art belongs to Home Affairs Bureau. So it's it's like, we've, we've always had kind of, we never really talk about, so we think about creative economy, yeah. you think about like design, architecture. Oh, yes. 
fashion uh-huh. and all yeah. these things, right? Yeah. There are all, all these other the film, all these film. other dis- uh-huh. disciplines. And then art is like, oh, art's just mm-hmm. art. So every time it's like, oh, oh, art, but commerce, oh, no, no, it's art. It's not us. So it's 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 a very strange uh, thing. So I mean, it's it's the attitude has changed, mm-hmm. but I think that's largely due to Art Basel. Yeah, <laughs> the success of Art Basel. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in the fine art, I was thinking about the School of Creative Media, which is. Um, Okay, I'm maybe going out on a limb here. Um, it's not yeah. just art. I mean, there's a lot of tech things in the School of Creative Media. So it's 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 a much wider uh, field of of inquiry, basically. And it was a question I think prepared by by Cassandra here. She was wondering if it was still possible in an environment like Hong Kong to do an art for arts thing. This thing and. My answer is yes, of course, because you know people have been doing it in Hong Kong for a very, very long time, and the idea that you can make art for institutions, for public uh, venues, and so on is a fairly recent proposition. I was thinking of a uh, uh, Warren Lantiwo doing his sort of research on all these artists who mattered in the 70s and 80s and who've completely disappeared. Even their works have disappeared. Uh, even Kurt Kurt Chan, who is still a a young man, you know, he's 57 or something like that. And all the work he did in the 90s has vanished. Uh, it wasn't preserved at all. So, you know, the art for art's sake thing has always been there and will always be there. But uh, when people compare my fine arts, tiny fine arts department, the idea is that we are more traditional, we're painters, we're calligraphers, <laughs> and so on. Whereas you guys are more tech savvy and more engaged. Well, I graduated a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, sure, okay, all right. <laughs> you mean it was less tech but savvy actually, in those days? But yeah. actually, um, uh, like what we have spoke about like, um, uh, yeah, before on stage, um, actually like artists like Zheng Bo and uh, like Leung Ji Wo and um, like other artists as well, like they actually, um, although they are actually in Creative media school, um, but then actually mm-hmm. they are pra- their practice is um, like very much lied into um, the contemporary art scene. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think actually it it go back into like what kind of framework you want to frame it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No, because I, I was mostly thinking about the fact that if you're a painter, you can always rely on Art Basel. <laughs> but if you're doing things like you know Warren, for instance, Lang Chiwo this really research-based installation. It ends up in videos, you know, like you, a lot of your installations, they basically exist for the duration of, of the show. How do, how do you make a living doing something like that, you see? Yeah. And it's a question, you know, I know, yeah. but a lot of people don't. <laughs> so um, I'll just kind of get a go-through of that, yeah. I prepared <laughs> kind of oh, good. <laughs> lies. Oh, no idea. <laughs> Artists also <Perfect>. mix lies. <laughs> Can I have the slides on? Uh, or I just need to press, press it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to go through, uh, not going into details about the concept of my works, but then just show you uh, like what Frank said, like what different spectrum like I have been working on. Um, so, um, so this is a project that commissioned by um, Rolls Royce Art Program um, in 2015. Um, basically, World Stars Art Program is an international art program that they are running, and then they commission artists like um, Yang Fu Dong, like uh, Angela Bollock, uh, like Isaac Julian, and um, I'm yeah. In 2015, they actually invite uh, me um, for this project, and um, they're super open for the commission. And um, I've just been given two words for the for the for start, and then like I create this um, four channel video installation. Um, actually, um, also about research. Um, I actually research about um, the context of um, Twin Moon, um, the new town in Hong Kong. Um, so, and then um, also recently, um, I also have been commissioned by Van Cleef and Apals, um for the um, jury school. Um, for um yeah because they actually have a summer school in hong kong um actually happens in um uh where is that um pmq exactly 
Yeah, so um, I was commissioned in the 2016 uh, edition. And so I, I actually, um, based on one of my work and then to um, continue with that um, uh, uh, idea of thinking and then to kind of match with, not match with, but then to use um, kind of the philosophy of the brand and then to kind of make it coherent with what I want to do. Actually, it's the same as um, what Rolls Royce uh, Art Commission as well. Um, so this is, um, yeah. And then um, also I um, work on um, exhibition with galleries. Um, I think like what Tina said, it's very important for artists to create a long term kind of a very strong relationship with gallery. And this is actually um, one of my, so uh, I mean, my solo show in um, Taipei um, at um, Asia Art Center. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so this is one of my uh, gallery show. And, um, and then also working with gallery, you will be working in a fair context, in an art fair context. And um, this is an in installation that um, being invited by um, Art Basel Hong Kong um, at the encounter section. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think without gallery, then you can never be able to participate in such I mean, even even you you are not able to um, reach into this platform. Um, yeah, so I think that's actually how galleries, the importance of galleries comes. Um, I mean, one of the importance of gallery comes, yeah. Um, and then, um, like what Alan have uh, spoken, um, shows with collections and also um, um, uh, acquired works. Um, so one of my work actually have been collected by um, one of the collectors in Hong Kong, and um, recently uh, the whole collection—I mean, not whole, but then a big number of the collection have been shown at Sotheby's, and um, so um, he have been um, showing one of my yeah in the exhibition he showcased my work as well, um, and then um, so speaking of the commission work, actually I it's two reason. Too, too recently, so I actually missed that. So actually, I have been commissioned by uh, Music Foundation um, to um, create a new uh, body, of, uh, not a new body of work, but then to create um, works um, for an exhibition um, in the just uh, March this year um, at the annex um, at the annex in Central um, in a group show context. But then I'm very happy about the show which um, I'm able to kind of consolidate um, one of my important projects that um, have been last for six years um, and is still going on. Um, and they very generously um, commissioned me to, um, to work on the, to, to kind of make new works and also to acquire the work as well. So I'm very happy about the, um, how it works. And um, apart from that, then I also um, teach in university. Um, I've been taking um, a part-time uh, teaching position in Academy of uh, Visual Art. And um, yeah, this is um, one of the teaching scene. Like um, I'm kind of talking to students about um, artists that have been inspired um, for inspiration for me. Um, in here is uh, Akira Buretti. And um, also on the picture on the right, um, it's actually I'm also being a, a workshop kind of, uh, uh, well, if you will, like a lecturer or like a, a leader um, to um, speaking with uh, uh, youngsters um, who are actually going to be into university um, of um, an art program which uh, organized by the Asia Art Archive. Um, so by using my own artwork um, to kind of create content for the students to, um, yeah, to work on um, a kind of a learning process. And like what I said recently, I also put myself uh, one more hat um, of being a writer as well. So this is uh, the latest writing that I've been uh, written for a, a friend as well, and also a very brilliant artist, uh, Lo Yok Moi. Uh, and um, yeah, um, this is the end of the slide, but actually I want to, yeah, so apart from all these, um, it's seemingly like a very fabulous,
But at the same time, like um, I'm actually just got off my work in Hong Kong U um, for research uh, precision. Um, so what I want to say is like to show um, actually how diverse artists are uh, working apart from their own artwork or like even in like working with artworks, like there are a whole wide range of spectrum. But at the same time, like um, we are also um, finding ways to kind of survive, yeah, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, how long do we still have? Okay, okay. I sorry, just just one more thing <laughs> about outreach programs. Um, they are very yeah, it's exactly but because you know a collector will show the work, organize some talks and so on, but they're never systematic things. How about M plus? What's the mission? I know it's very ambitious. Can you have can you say a few words about this? Oh we have an amazing yes. um colleague called Stella Fong who's the lead curator for learning and um uh, interpretation. Um I think outreach is kind of somehow a very um sort of demo day <laughs> it's really kind of not a not a very fashionable term i think it has a, this kind of i don't know it's um the way that uh stella's really been developing how m plus engages with audiences i guess that engagement is m more of a uh, an appropriate term is not just uh in a passive sense i think traditionally it's been very passive that you try to you know it's an it's an educational model um but i think it, uh from her perspective it's also to kind of um not make up for but perhaps to yeah i, I guess make up for compensate for um deficiencies in space i guess for our uh our youngsters to develop their own creativity and to have kind of um, trust in themselves in terms of uh, creative output. So trying to create situations for that creativity to emerge. Um, so that includes the summer camp, uh, which is a residential summer camp. It's, I think, four days, three nights. Um, and uh, it is modestly that I mean there's a modest fee but of course for kids that have uh, particular financial circumstances they can apply for a junteep or something um, but uh, also a rover which is a kind of roving creative studio so rather than taking art to the masses is actually about taking a lab or taking a studio to the masses and then having them create something with an artist. So we generally, the way that Stella's uh, um, designed it is that there's a kind of artist in residence who creates a kind of creative situation for um, secondary school kids. Um, but, you know, all of the programs, exhibitions, lectures, symposia, um, it's, these are all public programs and it's about reaching kind of into different sectors of our future audience. So everything that we do is about, you know, the website and um, everything. It's about um, creating the audience for M Plus when it opens. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, I was reminded of that because you mentioned uh, Lao Yopui, who is one of the founders of Rooftop Institute, who is also, you know, with the um, funding from the, the Home Affairs Bureau. And this time, not really, uh, it's not about art education, it's about education through the arts. And I think it's also very important to have both large institutions engaged into this, but also as many small institutions as we can to engage with the public very, very differently. So yes, I agree, the idea of an outreach program is sort of a passe, but uh, engagement can take so many different forms. Uh, that that's you know it's probably the, the the future I think of not just uh, art education but art itself I think so and yes Lao Yukmo is a very very good uh, example of this in fact yes so yes now for uh, the Q and A yeah mm -hmm. oh sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Inga Nelly. 
Um, I'm also a young artist, but I wanted to ask uh, Morgan, because it's, I find it quite interesting that you start writing, and uh, I had lately had a lot of discussions that there is m like uh, we that Hong Kong misses cultural journalism, and I I feel it also as an artist. If you, I think you maybe do not need galleries, but you could do artist one things, but you if you would have a better landscape of cultural journalism, this might be more visible. Uh, visible for everybody, like it would would support everybody. So, for example, also to um, Taina, um, do, is M Plus doing something to um, to foster this cultural journalism too? Because I think it could really help Hong Kong in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, well, I, I, we generate a lot of journalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, we've been working uh, for quite uh, quite some time on a, a digital platform, um, and it was conceived to be a, lo a lot more ambitious than it will eventually be, and uh, it will kind of feed into the eventual website. And um, initially, uh, um, we, we have a lot of content that's already been uh, generated, actually, but... Um, there were uh, plans for a kind of online journal as well as shorter kind of um, commentary pieces. Um, I think, you know, I think institutions worldwide, if you look at different kinds of websites from, let's say, the, the um, Walker, um, the Walker or um, Tate or MoMA, you'll see that there's in, an incredible amount of content um, that is very much kind of collection related. Um, the problem with cultural journalism, I think, for um, Hong Kong and worldwide is uh, a much bigger question which, uh, to do with the, the future of publishing um, and the economic model for publishing. Uh, and I think certainly with kind of social media, um, there is a lot of self-publishing, there is a lot of, um, yeah, you know, actually artists written commentaries. Um, the, the, the problem is how do you get paid? And I think to be able to uh, foster a really uh, good and deep um, cultural journalism, then there needs to be a really viable cultural model. There have been, you know, um, attempt sadly. I mean, one of the one of the good cultural magazines, uh, Parole, which is the French uh, Chinese cultural magazine, may not survive for much longer. But there there have been attempts like C for Culture um, that also didn't last for very long. I mean, maybe two years at the most. Um, and then Muse magazine, which was um, a very heroic effort at a bilingual cultural magazine, and uh, paid well. Uh, its writers, I mean, paid a decent wage for its writers, but eventually that also died. Um, so I think it's um, it's a it's a bit bigger problem more than just for art writing. It's for writing about literature, theatre, dance uh, across the board. Um, there are very good writers in Hong Kong. It's just finding the right uh, and equitable platform for them. And sadly, I mean, the future of publishing does not look good. Mm. To address your question, actually, um, a dear friend of M Plus and also, um, uh, yeah, of mine as well, um, Vivian Chow. Actually, she um, created a, a cultural journalist campus, which you should look it up, um, which is nurturing um, young cultural journalists, um, especially like she's running program. Um, I think especially throughout um, the season of Art Basel, because that's the time that a lot of things happen. Um, yeah, so I think I think actually she has been doing a great job about that. Um, so yeah, my answer to you is that. But also I want to add a note that um, about my writing. Actually, I don't see um, started to write as a mean of survival because I always think I always like writing. And um, apart from uh, so this is actually my first art review, but then I've been writing uh, more kind of academically writing as well. Um, and I think it's actually a way for artists to think in another dimension, yeah, and also to be more critical um, of your own work, and also um, by 
writing about other artists that you you like, actually you um, you think about yourself as well. So actually, it's a good way of thinking. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm playing a role of uh, the devil advocate. Uh, well, I'm from Hong Kong, so I'm very, very passionate about the Hong Kong art scene. So the creative economies of contemporary art in Hong Kong, I expect more from uh, this uh, seminar or this forum. Uh, it's interestingly, this is uh, when we look into the art ecology, uh, for these speakers, I think is we have good collectors like Alan, we have good artists like Morgan, uh, Tina, and then also Frank as moderator. We have a lot of talents, a lot of uh, uh, professional in Hong Kong, uh, like Alice uh, Asian Society. But the thing is, what is creative economy? I mean, uh, I mean, I'm a bit very frustrated uh, and disappointed by the Hong Kong art scene because we have so many good things, Art Basel, uh, uh, Art or it's the opera performance art team in Hong Kong. So, but what is creative? Alan just mentioned about something I think it interests me, about model. Do we have a new a creative model for contemporary art? We don't say about performance art, but contemporary art just not far not, but even looking at economies, uh, in the ecologies, we have artists, we have collectors, we have now museum uh, expert, uh, academia, but this uh, also this lady mentioned about art journalism. So the and uh, art critics, all this we have all in Hong Kong, but how to create and how to look at the economies of uh, contemporary art in Hong Kong. We can boom further. If we look into uh, nearby uh, air region, like in, uh, I, I, I mean, you mentioned about Singapore, but Singapore actually, the government uh, boosts a lot, but it, the, the market is still supported. If you look at it, uh, three years or four years ago, it boosts uh, at uh, say a stage, and then now I think it's, it's not so popular. And, and in the, 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 the gallery there, the National Gallery, I think, is really uh, not not too popular. So, Hong Kong, I think, you have all the uh, people here, uh, professional, and then the environment and the market next to us. If you look into China, Sun Jian said about Biennale, the next Biennale or contemporary art they were thinking about in next March. So, and then you have uh, like uh, Xi'an, Qingdu, even though in uh, Yinchuan you have a good museum. So how is Hong Kong? When we all talk about it, it seems like that we are doing all, all this soul searching on self-talk, on what we have done. Do we do anything in, the, in, the, in really uh, have a collective uh, energy and also the, um, how to look into Hong Kong? So I was thinking that in this summer, or this forum, we can have more insight on that from different aspects of the art ecologies. Sorry. Mm, it's okay, but you, you just described an ecology. I don't know what where you think there's something missing. I don't understand. I I, I would like to add to it. I mm -hmm. I this is the beginning uh, of a lot. That's why this show, our current exhibition of eleven Hong Kong artists, ten of them emerging, and most of them are in born in the eighties. I, I have to kind of disagree with you a little bit. I'm actually really excited. Um, I've been back to Hong Kong five years now, and the five and a half years all working here, and just the, the sense of energy, um, you know, that I've s witnessed. Um, and also in New York, having been in New York nine years before this, and New York has the ecology, and it has the Whitney Biennale, it has the museum. But here, we're in the beginning stages. So this is the beginning of many forums, and this is the beginning, this exhibition that we just, we're, you know, extending. I have to say, it's, I, I say this about every show, but this one has to be one of my favorite, in that I have no idea who these 11 artists were, uh, except one or two. And the, the show, um, nobody wanted to fund it. I have to tell you, nobody, uh, uh, because they were no names. But in the end, we got KPMG, Halem Chow and his foundation, and Willington and Virginia E, and uh, Edward, Edward Lang came in. 
And the show was not very uh, expensive put together. But in the end, we put together a, a wonderful show that CNN wrote about it, New York Times wrote about it, Ocular wrote about it, SCMP wrote about it. It's a show that we really didn't know what to expect and in the end has gotten a lot of great coverage, international coverage. And I have to say, six months ago, I think Ashley sitting there who helped uh, co carry the show, you know, so I sense the energy and that and whenever we have programs like this, this is the beginning and we're not New York. Thank goodness we're not New York. Um, it has a different energy. So I, I'm actually, I look forward to coming to work every day because of this institution like us, M plus, looking forward to it. And once M plus, and then Central Police Station, Dai Gwyn, if you remember New York after post-World War uh, II, the, the energy of New York, which the art history, I saw it, I read about it, and I have a feeling here, not just Hong Kong, but the whole region. So when I look at art, I think of the region, and I think Morgan talked talk about it, is art, it's, it has to go both ways. And Frank talks about it. It has to go both ways. And I think we're seeing it here. Art Basel is one example. And, and I think some of the artists that are already going out there, uh, Morgan's work, um, and some of, and in fact, yesterday we went to visit uh, Van Yip, one of our um, artists, and he's doing some fabulous things um, that somebody is going to help us acquire his work for our permanent. So I sense that energy here now, and I, I, I noticed your comment, we're going to do more program like this, and hopefully more free programs like this, so that we can engage and talk about how, I don't know how it's going to develop, but we're really excited in terms of helping to build the audience for the future of Hong Kong. I think a lot of, I think a lot of, I, I just uh, to echo your, your thoughts, I think, I think a lot of people still don't realize how important oh, and exciting the next five, 10, 15 years will be for, for, um, for Hong Kong and, and this whole region. Yes. Uh, as I said, I'm just challenging and pushing. Please, and you should. should. Go, go, go. I saw, you should. I saw you should. Alice, <laughs> you did a lot of things for Asian society, and Asian society did a lot of things for Hong Kong art scene and also the cultural scene as well. And I'm also looking forward for Tim to do some more things for the Daikon and for Hong Kong. Great, thank you. Um, on the Biennale note, I would just uh, mention um, I know it's, it's passe and, and Alice walking out of it. But in New York, our colleague in New York is looking at perhaps contributing to the New York art scene of talk, possibly doing an Asia theme Biennale so that we can profile some of these Hong Kong uh, and Asian artists in New York. Um, I do feel like in New York there is this missing, you know, you do, Whitney Biennale, two great curator this year, young Asian American curator, but there is a missing voice of Asian artists in cities. I, and I don't know if Morgan will agree with me or Tina, there are missing voice of Asians in art scene in London, Berlin, and New York. And I think we need to help address that. So Asia Society New York is working on it and we're gonna be partnering with them. So on that positive note, I wanna thank you all for being here and continue to support us and continue to support all of uh, these artists and, and the institution. And thank you, Frank.